This is a glider that you can design and build on a budget. It's a great resume builder for any mechanical engineer. And in this video, I'm gonna show you exactly how to build it from first sketch to first flight. Most tutorials either skip the hard parts or drown you in endless theory without actually building anything. But in this video, we're going full stack from napkin sketch to simulation and CAD to crash test. But there's a catch, no electronics. No stabilization, no flight controllers, just aerodynamic design doing the heavy lifting. This isn't about copying design, it's about learning to think like an engineer. You'll watch me make real design decisions, analyze real data, crash real hardware, and explain what went wrong along the way and how I fixed it. The first version didn't work, but the second flew and you'll see exactly what changed. And by the end, you'll know not just what to build, but why it flies. My name is Jude. I'm a mechanical engineer and grad student, and I've done tons of projects, ranging from wheelchair lifts to battle bots. In this glider, I designed to test real aerodynamic behavior, no flight controllers, just pure aerodynamic engineering. Now, let's build something that actually teaches you something along the way. So here's exactly what we're building, a dynamically stable glider with no control services, no flight controller, and no electronics. If it pitches up, it corrects. If it noses down, it recovers, all through smart geometry and aerodynamic balance. No tech bailing us out, this time. Basically, the goal is to build something that flies on its own and teaches you real engineering while doing it. It also has to be cheap and easy to build. I used a 3D printer, some carbon fiber rods, scotch tape, and a window insulation kit. Nothing too exotic. And while we're building it, you'll get hands-on with concepts like pitching moment, aerodynamic dampening, and center of gravity placement. All things you've probably seen in the classroom, but never actually used. If you're the kind of student who wants a project that looks good on a resume and teaches you to think like an engineer, this is it. All right, here's my initial sketch. Pretty groundbreaking stuff, right? Van Gogh might be out of a job now that I'm on the scene. But seriously, if you can hold a pencil, you can sketch a plane, and you should. Sketching helps lock in proportions and spot issues before you're 40 features deep on CAD. I'd recommend doing at least a top view and a front view, and try to stay realistic with your sizings. I base mine loosely off of a business set layout. It's symmetric, simple, and inherently stable. It might be tempting to design based off of a fighter jet or a bomber. Believe me, I get it. I once designed a B-2 Spirit-inspired flying wing, and while it looked amazing in pictures, it flew like a confused frisbee. Remember, if it looks balanced, it probably behaves better in air. Once you have a sketch that feels right, you'll have a visual guide that'll make aerodynamic modeling much easier. Now that we've got a concept sketch, it's time to see how it performs in air before we even open CAD. Start by installing XFLR5, a free aerodynamics analysis tool that lets you model airfoils, simulate aircraft behaviors, and predict stability characteristics with surprising accuracy for something that looks like it's from 1998. While that's installing, let's pick some airfoils. Head to an online airfoil database and open up one of the data books. What you're looking for is a high maximum lift coefficient, a smooth gradual stall behavior, and solid performance at low Reynolds numbers since we're working with the small cord and slow airspeed. Download coordinate files for a few candidates you like. You'll be testing them in XFLR5 shortly. I ended up going with the FX63137, which is a proven high lift airfoil used in a lot of RC sailplanes, but feel free to explore. You'll get a better intuition by testing different ones yourself. Now open XFLR5 and go to direct analysis. Import your airfoil. I've linked a quick video in the description that shows exactly how to do this. Then repanel it. This cleans up the coordinate points without changing the shape. Definitely don't skip this step, it improves the simulation accuracy and prevents weird behaviors in the plots. Quick warning though, sometimes imported airfoils will look broken. Like this one, it had a centerline issue that contorted the whole shape after repaneling. If this happens, it's usually because the coordinate file is in the wrong order. It should go trailing edge along the top surface to the leading edge, and then along the bottom surface back to the trailing edge. If it's not like this, reorder the coordinate points manually or use AI tools to clean it up. Now, go to batch analysis and define a range of Reynolds numbers, from about 1,000 to 10 million and everything in between, and angles of attack between negative 10 to positive 16 degrees. This generates plots for lift and drag coefficients. XFLR5 also lets you generate NACA airflows directly in the software, which is super helpful for symmetric fins. That's what I use for mine and what I recommend for yours. Now, go to the plane design module and start a new plane. I won't tell you exactly what design to use because honestly, that's the fun part, but here are some general tips. Add wing sweep and dihedral to help with lateral stability, remember to follow your concept sketch, and don't go overboard. You're not modeling a transformer. You may have noticed that we're not modeling the fuselage within this software, and some of y'all 
with perfect 4.0 GPAs who went to honors school might feel like being a little extra and doing it anyways, but you'd actually be doing your analysis a disservice. It reduces the accuracy of it just because it creates instabilities within the methods XFOR5 uses. So just omit the, the fuselage and keep your analysis accurate. All right, let's see how this thing actually flies using a plane analysis. Set a realistic throwing speed, 25 feet per second is about what you can expect, and set the AOA to go from around negative 15 to 10 degrees. And don't worry if it fails at some AOAs, that's normal. What you want to focus on is the pitching moment curve. Specifically, pay attention to the slope and the x-intercept. This graph is critical. It tells you how the angle of attack affects the pitching moment. What you want is a negative slope. Basically what that means is when the aircraft pitches up or down, it naturally returns to level flight. It's like a marble in a bowl. Give it a nudge and it rolls back to the center. Stability. A positive slope is like taking that same marble and putting it on an upside down bowl. Give it a nudge and it accelerates away from equilibrium. No recovery from divergence. It's like an aircraft that can't recover from a gust of wind and nose dives until it eats dirt. No bueno. To get that negative slope, you have to balance the moments created by the wings and the elevators about the center of gravity. If the CG is too far forward, the nose won't lift. Too far back and you'll lose stability because the elevators can't compensate. The x-intercept is where the pitching moment equals zero. That's your aircraft's trim angle, or in other words, the AOA it finds equilibrium at. You want that to be around three to five degrees because that's where most airfoils are most efficient at generating lift with minimal drag. Now, at first glance, my slope looked great, but only because the center of gravity gravity defaults to the origin of your plane's coordinate system, which in my case is the leading edge of the wings, not realistic. So I moved it about 3 inches back from the leading edge and reran the analysis. Suddenly the slope weakened and the x-intercept was still at a negative AOA. To fix that, I swapped the elevator airfoil to a NACA profile which generates less lift. This gave me a much better moment curve and after some iterating, I eventually got an x-intercept around 5 degrees, right where I wanted it. Now it's important to do that step before you actually design the CAD model and 3D print all your parts because because otherwise you end up just wasting a lot of time and filament. Last thing before moving on, let's figure out how much lift and drag your aircraft produces. Export the analysis from XFOR5 and open it in Excel. Add columns for lift, drag, air density, velocity, and planform area. You'll want to get your aircraft's planform area from XFOR5. It's listed in the analysis panel. Now, plug in the lift and drag equations. And yes, I know this was probably bothering some of y'all. My rows were off, and yes, I did fix it. But once you have those equations coded in, you'll be able to estimate how heavy your aircraft can be while still generating enough lift to fly. We'll revisit stability analysis later once we have real mass properties, but for now, let's jump into CAD. Now that we've verified our aerodynamics, it's time to turn sketches into something printable. I'm using SolidWorks, but you can follow along on any CAD tool you're comfortable with. Begin with the fuselage, and then attach the wings based on the layout you designed in XFOR5. I won't go into full detail since it's pretty standard CAD work, but the goal is to create the aircraft shape from your XFOR5 model, which will later split into 3D printable parts. If you're unsure about how to model your airfoil, don't worry, it's simpler than it looks. I've linked a video that walks you through it. Once that's done, your CAD model should look something like this, and now you're ready to break it into pieces. Start by dividing the fuselage into a series of rings. These act like ribs or a skeleton that will later wrap in plastic wrap. We're trying to preserve the shape while minimizing weight. Down the center, we'll run a wooden dowel to give it structure and strength, although I didn't end up using the dowel in the final design. For your wings and elevators, you have two options. Option 1, ribs and spars. This saves weight but takes more time to model. Option 2, just model the surfaces solid and maybe split them to fit your print bed as needed. Originally, I planned to just model the elevators and fins as solid parts and the wings using ribs and spars, but I eventually switched everything to being solid because it would involve less CAD headache, but that decision came back to bite me, so if I were y'all, I would just model everything as ribs and spars. It's way more work up front, but you'll thank yourself later. Once your assembly looks good, open your slicing software and load in all the parts, but don't print anything quite yet. We're just using the slicer to estimate the mass of each part. Take those mass estimates and manually input them into your CAD model's mass properties, overriding the existing mass estimate. Then reload your full assembly to get accurate data on the center of gravity and moment of inertia. That'll be crucial for our next phase, stability analysis. Now that your CAD model has accurate weights, it's time to simulate how the aircraft reacts in flight. In XFOR5, define a new stability analysis. Input the mass properties from your CAD assembly, center of gravity, total mass, and moments of inertia. 
Pro tip, make sure your axes line up with XF405's coordinate system and that you're using the moments of inertia around the COG. If not, your analysis won't be accurate. Once set, XF405 generates a red dot on the polar plot, indicating your current trim condition, but what matters are the simulated dynamic modes. Your aircraft has eight natural dynamic modes, four longitudinal and four lateral, and you should check all of them. Each one tells you something about how the glider responds to different types of disturbances. Longitudinal modes cover pitch behavior, while lateral modes handle roll and yaw. While this doesn't model the full aerodynamics, using these modes are actually a fairly standard industry practice when preliminarily designing aircraft. Here's what you're looking for. The response should decay over time. If the aircraft oscillates and settles, great. If it keeps going or the movement grows, you've got an instability. In that case, you'll need to redesign the part that's causing the problem. Issues with longitudinal modes usually point to the center of gravity, tail moment arm, or elevator sizing and effectiveness. On the other hand, instability in lateral and directional modes typically indicate a problem with vertical fin size, wing dihedral or mass distribution across the wingspan. This is your chance to make major performance changes before building a flawed prototype. All right, it's time to build, but keep in mind that this was my first iteration and it doesn't include all the steps that I now recommend. I'll show you those fixes in the iteration section, but this version was just my test bed. To build your aircraft, first slice your parts in your 3D printing software, then load your files onto a mini SD card, pop it into your printer, and start printing. Because I modeled my wings as solid pieces, printing took multiple days. If you use ribs and spars like I suggest, it'll be much faster. Once everything is printed, bring your parts inside, start with the fuselage. Mark how far each ring should go on the dowel, slide the rings onto the dowel, and attach your wings, elevators, and fins. Next, apply paint primer onto the parts where the double-sided tape will go. This gives better adhesion. Once dried, apply Apply the double-sided tape, cut your plastic wrap to size, and gently stretch it over the frame. You'll probably need an extra set of hands to hold things in place. Trim the excess with scissors and use scotch tape to patch gaps or seal any weak points. Finally, grab a blow dryer and heat the wrap until it tightens across the frame. This part is ridiculously satisfying. Now that it's fully wrapped, we're ready for the first test. So here's how it went. I threw the plane and it immediately crashed. Hard. It broke apart like that Lego sound effect in video games, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, not ideal, but honestly, I kind of expected that. This version weighed 737 grams, and I knew from my analysis that that was too heavy, but I had already 3D printed the parts before doing my analysis, so I just kind of wanted to throw it to get data. What I observed from that flight confirmed my suspicion. The trajectory looked exactly like projectile motion, or if I had thrown a tennis ball, it would have taken the same path. That told me something crucial. The aerodynamic forces were being completely overpowered by mass and momentum. I needed to make my design lighter, so it was time to iterate. If you've gotten this far and you've learned something, Thing, hit the like button, it really helps the channel out. And if you want to dive into my project files and see exactly what I did to design mine, they're linked in the description. This is where your path and mine might diverge. Your glider might fail in a totally different way, and that's okay. You'll need to troubleshoot based on what you see. Here's how I fixed mine. First, I replaced the wooden dowel with square carbon fiber tubes. The reason why is because the dowel weighed 100 grams, while a slightly longer length of carbon fiber weighed only 44 grams. Plus, it's stiffer, straighter, and the square shape prevents fuselage discs from rotating. This change required some redesign of the fuselage discs to match the square profile, and I had to rotate their mounting slot by 45 degrees to align everything in the assembly just right. I also merged the discs around the wings and the ones around the elevators and fin into larger, single parts. That boosted strength and automatically space them correctly. Then I went into XFR5. Advanced analysis gives you access to more features. Enabling tilted geometry makes the results more accurate, though it will take a bit longer to run. You can also manually input mass properties here, which is super helpful for matching your CAD assembly. I went through a few design tweaks, mainly increasing the size of the elevator and adding some positive twist. That let me shift the center of gravity farther back to about 7 inches aft of the wing's leading edge. This meant I didn't need as much counterweight at the nose, which made the glider a lot lighter overall. I also swapped the 36 inch dowel for a 1 meter carbon fiber tube, giving the counterweight just over three more inches of moment arm. That extra leverage meant I could use even less counterweight to get the same balance. By the way, if you're into engineering projects like this one, subscribe for more. I've got some even more resume building projects coming up. While waiting for the carbon fiber tubes, I started reprinting parts. My printer gave out halfway through though, so I borrowed a friend's machine to finish and had to order a new print bed to fix mine. Once everything was printed, I cut the carbon fiber spars using an oscillating saw, assembled and glued the new fuselage, primed the necessary areas, added nose weights using nuts, and lastly applied double-sided tape and wrapped everything in plastic again. This time, wrapping the wings, elevators, and fin was way more work, but absolutely worth it. The result was 45% of the original weight, way stronger, and hopefully more stable. 
Not bad. Let's take it flying. Alright, so this is actually my second time throwing this, and the first time, you can see it cracked a little bit here, so I'm not sure if it'll withstand this throw, but fingers crossed on that. This version had all the upgrades. Lighter wings, stronger fuselage, and a well-placed CG. I double-checked everything to make sure it was flight ready. I was really nervous as this was the culmination of weeks of work. I gave it a firm throw and this time it actually flew. It climbed, stabilized, and tracked forward for a bit before it rolled too much and nosedived. Sure, the landing wasn't pretty and one of the wings broke off at the fuselage disc. But what mattered was those first few moments. It flew straight, the longitudinal behavior was stable, it was generating lift, and the pitch response matched the simulations. The failure mode was different this time though. It was lateral instability, likely caused by an undersized fin. So yeah, it crashed, but this crash was progress. It proved the core idea that you don't need a flight controller to be stable in the air. The redesign flew, it was stable in pitch, and it responded the way the simulations predicted. To fix it, I'd probably increase the vertical fin size, tweak the wing dihedral, and check for asymmetries in the plastic wrap assembly. But at this point, the the glider had already proven what I needed. It can fly without electronics using aerodynamics to stabilize itself. If you're thinking about building your own version, here's everything you'll need. I've linked it all in the description. Expect to spend around 40 to 60 working hours total. That includes design, analysis, assembly, and iteration. You could crank it out in like two to three weekends if you're focused. The second version wasn't perfect, but it flew, and that proved the core idea that you can build a passively stable glider with nothing but smart geometry and basic tools. And that's what this project is about. Not just getting something in the air, but understanding why it flies. It'll crash and you'll fix it, and every version will fly just a little bit better, making you a better engineer. See you next time.